welcome Professor Eric Ferron, who's the organizer of this conference, and probably most of you know him. Uh, he's going to be speaking on a project. Uh, I'm one of the people working on it. It's about modular drones uh, when geometry meets uh, flight. Welcome, Professor. Okay, thank you. I, I want to talk to you about uh, sort of, uh, a little subject that we've been working on over the past few years and that's slowly contaminating uh, the team at KAUST. Actually, pretty fast. Uh, past, fastly contaminating the team at KAUST, which is about a mix of uh, my passion for geometry on the one hand with flight, which is one of the things I do. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I do anyway. Uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, some background on the modular rotocraft vehicles. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, a certain uh, modules, tetrahedral modules, dodecahedral modules. I go quickly over control location, structural properties, optimal configuration. You will know if I talk about it because we just don't have the time. And uh, But nevertheless, I don't want you to miss the opportunity to see our fantastic prototypes. So that I will talk about. Now, here's the true story. I had two students in my lab that was at Georgia Tech. One of them was working on the future of 3D printing. Uh, the other was working on a wheel that nature could have invented. I was thinking of these projects as like serious projects. You know, if you could print a cantilevered beam with like a, a specific stiffness uh, property to it on the one hand, and if you could make a wheel that nature could have invented on the other hand, given all the science articles that argue against it, I thought I would have, on the one hand, something useful, and on the other hand, something I could at least publish somewhere in nature or science. And uh, it was going well until I asked the students, so how do you feel about your research? And they told me, I don't like it. I said, what? So I'm like stretching my mind to the best possible extent, and you don't like it? So I sat and said, so what do you want to do? And one said, I want to do modular vehicles. And the other said, I want to do modular vehicles. I was like, okay. So I started thinking, okay, so this modular vehicles, okay. So like for three months, I thought about them and uh, tried to think about something. And, uh, and nothing came up. Uh, was, uh, my, my brain was like flat. No, no response whatsoever to that impulse. But that was, um, I mean, that was a rather frustrating thing. But alhamdulillah, I'm also a professional goof-off. This is why, by the way, I, I have a, the hardest kind of working relationship with uh, Bilal is because he looks too much like me, you know, sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> goofing off all the time, uh, you know, trying to pull jokes as, uh, as well as possible. And I think that uh, you're a lot more successful than I am. I try, but you succeed. And then, uh, goofing off, I browse the web. And at some point, I see, bim, this. I say, ah, okay, finally, something interesting. Uh, this is named Sierpinski tetrahedron. And uh, it has some interesting properties. It's made of elements that itself. Uh, in the limit, and by the way, so self-similar objects, also named fractal objects, are, have been uh, and still are like kind of uh, entertaining uh, things to work with now, as they were about 33 years ago when I took a course on uh, fractal sets. And by the way, who is the guy who is hiding behind, if you can see his uh, trace? So he's the founder of uh, fractal uh, sets or fractal geometry named Benoit Mandelbrot. And uh, so that was, at, uh, that was sort of a kid's uh, activity at uh, Yale University where he was teaching. And uh, they were made, uh, the little uh, tetrahedra were made of uh, folded paper. Yes, Obada, you would get to that level of complexity. So... Uh, that said, now here is the official start. Okay. I mean, because, you know, from then on, uh, things sort of uh, went a little bit out of control. So I might as well put some structure in it and say, 
So we have a background on modular rotorcraft, right? So, you know, every thesis starts with like a hack. And then, you know, you sort of uh, unroll the hack, see what you get, okay, in the end. And then in the end, you say, no, it's a mess. I cannot tell the story that way. So then you sort of rearrange everything. And then you, it looks like your thesis is a masterpiece that every other student looks at and says, Oh, it must have been inspired by God. How did this start? I mean, how did this start? And most theses are well understood, I would say, in the Western world, to do like you read the Quran. Okay, you start from the end, and then you flip backwards. Okay, well, it's because Arabic is written from right to left and from end to front, of course. But I think that, you know, then you read the truth, which is, you know, the numerical application at the end or the example, that's what started it, okay? And like the heavy, deep insight with the introduction at the beginning, that's what happened last, all right? And then you want to understand the story. It very often starts with a hack. And then you sort of unroll the hack. So now we're going back into like thesis mode. And we say, well, there was a background on modular rotorcraft. Well, of course there was not. Okay, we figured it out later. Uh, and uh, what's a modular rotorcraft? A system of self-contained rotorcraft modules that can assemble in various configurations to form a variety of uh, area vehicles. So remember, okay, this is like a work done late. Okay, so you know, not at the beginning. Uh, so we found out that uh, there were like people who got interested in the modular rotorcraft, for example, for doing uh, cargo transportation. You know, to lift heavy objects, uh, you need a heavy vehicle. But then if you need each time to lift a heavy object, you need to bring a heavy vehicle like a helicopter over. I mean, this is not a an expensive, a cheap uh, possibility. So, um, So the idea is to put a number of modules and then change the size of the, the number of modules depending on what you're after. Uh, there are other uh, possible activities. There are other justifications for modularity. And one of them is to sort of be able and create uh, flying machines that are able to sort of configure themselves for like an uh, amazing number of configurations. Uh, the first one, by the way, the Sky Gorge, Gorge I just saw a version of it at Aramco, uh, at Aramco's uh, research lab, like right next door to here, okay? Other advantages, redundancy, you have several little you know, machines, they're all like equipped with their own stuff, you know, so if one machine fails, the others take over and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we like is uh, the easy storage, transportation, and deployment. You know, if uh, I mean the idea of having like little modules that you sort of put together, uh, and then of course I will never ever uh, displease my uh, initial uh, research advisor at Stanford University, Jean Claude Le Tom, who said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could have like a table that's made out of small robots that self assemble? I said, I think that's a stupid idea. He said, you what? I said. Uh, Okay, I'll think about it. And, uh, and there have been examples of um, modular systems. Uh, so Boeing came up with a uh, planar drone assembly uh, that would be used to lift heavy, uh, uh, heavy uh, masses. Sometimes I wonder if, if we're still acting wisely, but if Boeing did it, okay, that gives us the authorization to do it too. Uh, Raffaello D'Andrea at uh, ETH Zurich uh, looked at also self-assembling uh, drones. And uh, there were also uh, folks at UPenn who did that. Then there are uh, people in Japan who thought about the uh, Christine version of uh, uh, modular drones, whereby the drones can arrange themselves in the form of a snake, so that finally snake may <laughs> make it into the air uh, beyond uh, what I would call falling with grace, even though I have read the article about how uh, the undulation mechanism and everything confers them with a, a form of uh, um, attitude stability, which is very precious. And, um, and uh, so, so um, yes, 
uh, there are many of these modular drones. Now, one of the things that uh, we're thinking about is um, first the NICS for uh, uh, six degree of freedom actuation capabilities. Uh, and that's not me, that's the student who thought about this. Me, I thought, you know, non-rigid arrangements, they can add weight and points of failures, okay? So that I thought about, okay? And uh, the problem with planar configurations, they lose their rigidity as their size increases. You know, they, they start as a one rigid machine, you add two of them and it's still okay. Now you put 10 of them and you, you start having these sort of oscillations uh, of sorts that make life very uncomfortable and uh, which is kind of shown here. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, with a with a an ad hoc uh, structural simulation, so so we thought about a couple of things, and I'm not going to cover all of them. Uh, I won't have time. And uh, we thought about tetrahedral modules. Okay, so that's the picture from Mandelbrot uh, from Yale. The idea is to start with a regular tetrahedron, and then. And then say, okay, we're going to call that one module. Then what do we do with this one module? Well, we stack four of them into creating a larger module, uh, which is made of four of these initial modules. And then, of course, you stack four of them, and you get another vehicle, okay? And each time, they double in size, okay? And then you can go from generation zero to generation one, one to two, two to three, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that the further the generation, the prettier it is, and uh, we will see that later. But there are some interesting things happening. We thought one module, one propeller. So we started looking at how the propellers, if we uh, put one propeller on one module, how the propellers would stack up. And then we saw, oh, they stack up perfectly well. They don't overlap. You can mix that with uh, some knowledge of uh, aerodynamics to say that it means that when you operate the propellers, they will operate pretty much independently from each other, okay? The, the thrust produced by the four propellers is the sum of the thrust produced by each propeller, okay? And that happens, uh, remains as you go towards building an ever larger system I tell you, you know, I like geometry. I like uh, weird-looking objects, and uh, and I got my full content of those objects. We get, on average, in the end, you you get to feel the surface of a triangle at about sixty percent with propellers if you go that way. Okay, and then came one of the two students who loves to read. I say, uh, Eric, you know, I was looking at the web and I found this. I said, what is this? And it turns out that the idea of stacking up tetrahedra uh, in order to create a better flying machine was not ours. Uh, it came from uh, Alexander Graham Bell, but uh, he, he got crazy about flying stuff, you know. After making this intensely useful uh, thing named the telephone, then he decided, okay, let me try and fly. Okay, and he got into creating these beautiful kites that you can still uh, find today. In fact, uh, you can build them yourself, and I'll show you how later. But these kites are made of the same kind of modules that we had thought about. And uh, yes, there was a, a race to gigantism, getting like the craziest kite. And the only thing that he would do and that we refused to do, despite the model uh, offered by uh, Mohammed about hiring our own in order to do test is to attach a human to it and see if the whole thing takes off. So the students, they see, they, they, they went into the hack. You see, we're deep into the presentation and now came the first thing they did. Okay. Uh, the rest came after. Uh, what I presented before came after. And then they, they started building this thing. They made like uh, one drone made out of four different modules. And then, um, and then they flew it. And, um, well, they flew it, you know. You, you may want to think, was that flying, really? As we notice in many of the movies uh, in this presentation, uh, the beginning of the movie is there, and then there's an abrupt stop. <laughs> and, and, you know, let's be clear, 
Okay. Every time there is a abrupt stop is because there is a crash. Okay. And you will see more of that uh, thanks to Mohammed, uh, but thanks to uh, Bilal's effort at submitting a paper this morning. Uh, so we're, we're not all professional pilots. No, me neither. I'm not. I'm a private pilot. And um, my wife once flew with me and said, such a gesture of goodwill. Okay. Don't you ever hope you're going to, I'm going to go with you again. And uh, so, so then there was a, a second generation made, and as the second generation was made, uh, it moved from Joyotech to Kaust. And uh, so it was uh, made by, uh, by actually these guys, uh, Bilal and Obada. And then we flew. Okay. So I don't know why the other one doesn't go, but, well, we're going to fly directly the one that uh, had like uh, four modules, four small modules stacked up. So you see, we don't have too many mosquitoes uh, around here, but uh, you know we're perfectly able to recreate the ambience. <laughs> and uh, so we got the the four uh, the four module version uh, flying, which is uh, when I say we, Obada was able to get the four. Uh, module version, each uh, version, if each module has four propellers, so that's like 16 motors running in parallel. And, and then, of course, my, my expectation is, uh, oh, okay, there is the small one. As you see, not only do the thrust of the engines add up, but also the noise that they make adds up. Okay, so we have this nice uh, little uh, flying cage uh, here at Kaust, and you're going to see like all the creative uses we're making with it. So uh, over the turn of the year, Obada created this 64 propeller version. And uh, with the objective of saying, Does this, is it still true that with 16 modules, we can lift 16 times more than with one volume? Or with one module, okay? So, uh, so uh, uh, there we are, okay? With uh, these uh, 16 modules stacked up, and this is a picture that was taken yesterday at the, at the gala. And then, uh, as always in these uh, projects, you know, uh, race towards gigantism and everything, our role is to try as, as um, supervisors and, you know, is to try and find, okay, so what is the, the cool little thing that we could see popping up as part of uh, this research, you know, like stuff that we can uh, write papers about? Because uh, in general, like talking about the whole system is not what people, what attracts people's attention. It's more like the little problems that we had on the side. And then we thought, so take a little module, take it out of the truck and assemble it with the others, okay? Each module has its own little navigation system. And just like we human come into the world, uh, one of our first questions is, okay, so who am I and what am I doing here? Uh, the, uh, so we started thinking, well, so do we really have to label each? each module, and then we are going to have to stack them up in a proper uh, way, or should they figure out uh, what they're doing? So the first thing is we, we sort of say, okay, let's use some kind of in-flight adaptive control to sort of figure out who is what and who is doing what while in flight. And I thought, this is never going to work. At least it's not going to be uh, recommended. So we came up with something a little simpler, which is just see how many initial gestures we have to apply to the machine uh, uh, in order for the machine to kind of know itself. Uh, it would be nice that the machine could do it itself instead of uh, a human having to manipulate it. But hey, you know, uh, we still have like a few months before the paper that we just submitted to the conference on control technology and application um, happens. So, you know, Obada, you know the message. If you want to discover Trieste, the beautiful city in Italy, this thing must be able to do that automatically. So, and then, of course, uh, you start doing that, and then the students start like having ideas of their own. And uh, so one of them is Bilal, and he said, you know, your machine is nice, but 
you know, those, uh, those machines that hover are very popular, but they're definitely not energy efficient. Okay. As soon as you want to move fast, uh, nothing replaces a good pair, uh, a good pair or uh, a trio of uh, wings. So Bilal started adding wings to the machine. And the, the wings, of course, brings us back to Bell. But the way Bell arranged them was this way, whereas we are arranging them that way. It's the same tetrahedron, but the, the lifting surfaces are arranged differently. And, um, and uh, by the way, this is what I want to share with you in order to make some of these Bell uh, kites. Uh, you can do it with basically plastic, Straws, plastic straws, or paper straws, and string, okay? With that, people have been stacking these up to create, like, monsters having more than 128 of those stacked up on each other. They take them out, and they actually fly. They're, like, the most beautiful kites uh, that I know of, and the most modular kites that I know of. And they are like entire clubs. NASA publishes stuff about how to do that and everything. And then this is Bilal is like sort of going crazy and saying, okay, well, let's see what kids will write if I give them a panel, a fractal panel made of, um, uh, well, uh, 16 basic units. Okay, so that was at the library yesterday. Uh, I heard news that one of the kids crashed into the machine, but as far as I could see, these machines are very robust. Okay, they're very robust. And I will show you proof of that <laughs> by showing you like the, the movie that Bilal came up with yesterday as part of our submission to IROS for next year. Okay, so yes, the machine is able to take off. You notice so at, at the end, you know, it always stops just before the landing. Then, yes, the machine is able to roll, kind of. It's able to pitch. And then, and then you start noticing that this machine, maybe it's able to yaw, but it seems to be going dangerously close to the ceiling. And then if you look closer, you will start noticing that after, you know... I, I didn't have a pilot. A few hours of doing this, some of the panels of the drone become increasingly flexible, okay? And uh, as if they were, uh, in fact, you know, on the, on the way to destruction. So we did also like a flight test with one or more modules. We still are wondering, okay, how do we transition from hovering flight to forward flight? There is uh, some knowledge about this, um, especially in the RC community. But if we were able to do that, at least we would be able to say that our drone can go at least some distance without like uh, using all the, all the propeller power. So let me use the last five minutes to talk about uh, then, you know, how a student can start like going crazy over things. Uh, he didn't like my tetrahedra. Uh, it's the other student. His name is uh, Kevin Garanger. And he said, I don't like tetrahedra. I prefer dodecahedra. And there we go, building dodecahedrally shaped vehicles. Okay, so what's a dodecahedron? Is this thing. And uh, I mean, they're nice. Uh, dodecahedron, dodecahedra have um, 12, uh, 12 facets and, uh, and a growing number of vertices and edges, for sure. Uh, each facet could be represented also by a little ray of a star. And the latest dodecahedron put into action that I heard of was on top of one of the towers of the Sacrada Familia in Barcelona, in Spain. That crazy building needed no less than a crazy star on top of it. So um, that said, uh, it has some interesting uh, properties. In particular, uh, the dodecahedron is invariant. It has, uh, of course, uh, an, um, an invariant group uh, that's kind of uh, interesting and that allows to, uh, for example, given one module equipped with one propeller to like, reorient the module in a number of ways while achieving still one of the things that we want, which is that there be some kind of 
easy attachment between the modules. Okay. So, um, listen, I think I'm producing the right animation given the music. So, uh, these modules, so again, that's, that's this student going adrift. The story is that I was here and he was in, uh, in, uh, California, as a matter of fact. And, um, he tells me, Eric, I need hardware. So I write the purchase order for hardware and everything, you know, authorizing to spend uh, my business, my, uh, my uh, MX card on stuff. You know, I, he had prepared me a list. Okay. When I see what he bought, there was not a single part that was from the original list he gave me. I say, and now I'm going to have to justify that purchase. So, so it's, I asked him, so let's look at the common parts. I mean, are there things you purchased that we actually plan to purchase? He said, no, there is not a single one. I said, okay, good luck, good luck to me. This is the last time you hear about my, uh, my American Express card. But anyway, so eventually he came up with a number of ways to justify why the decahedra were better than uh, tetrahedra. Uh, started like uh, inscribing squares and all, lots of things like that. Pretended that you can actually optimize the configuration of uh, of this dodecahedral element to provide like both attitude and uh, translational control, force control, uh, by using uh, mixed integer programs, uh, as you can uh, hear about them in uh, operations research. But in the end, yeah, it looks pretty good. And uh, he started building like a few standard configurations. And it would have been nice until he decided that to build them. So I will skip all the control location stuff. I mean, this is boring. This is all about optimization and uh, stuff like that. But on the other hand, uh, yes, he built the modules. So the, there is, there are my uh, $10,000 worth of equipment coming. And uh, the, the only thing, but it was very important, the only thing that came directly from Saudi, made in Saudi, are the connectors between the routes. Okay. Those connectors are so useful. They experimented like mad until they came up with an ideal kind of connector that would be sufficiently tight to hold the rod and sufficiently flexible so that when the thing collapses, the whole thing doesn't explode. And it actually works. So you can see why he's very proud of these little joints here. They actually 3D printed some kind of um, uh, foamy kind of material uh, that would act as a joint. And I mean, they experimented like mad, but eventually it works, okay? And uh, they came up with a number of uh, configurations once they built all these uh, these little modules. You know, there are like configurations, lots of configurations that uh, they looked at um, just to explain and to justify the versatility offered by those tetrahedra. And then I think the biggest one was that. It's actually a, it's, 16 modules arranged in the assemblage of four tetrahedra, and each tetrahedron is made of indeed four, uh, four um, uh, the, uh, the decahedra modules. And then they flew them. And uh, that I got by email. Uh, let's see, let me start it. So I got by email, and I thought, okay, fine. Okay, this is a quadrotter. I'm happy. Okay, then uh, then they started flying this with six of them. You can see the rope that's attached to. Okay, the rope plays no role except to recover if the disaster truly happens. Okay, then uh, uh, after that they came up with a, a, a triangular version with ten rudders, and uh, you can start seeing like the 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 curtains flying around and, you know, this was a relatively small room. And then they eventually faced the, the, uh, the question, should we actually fly all 16 modules together in that room? And they said, oh, they told me they would rather go to a more sophisticated facility. And I told them, well, you know, you know how to use this one. There is an opti track. There is plenty of equipment there. Keep using it. And then the tornado really happened. Okay, so now you have 16 modules. I mean, this thing is almost impossible to lift. It's so heavy. Okay, and uh, and these 16, uh, so these 16 modules are not collaborating in order to get this thing off the ground and flying. 
Okay, so this is uh, where I want to stop this uh, uh, presentation. There are plenty of little technical issues that we looked at uh, as we're doing that, including the aerodynamics of this in terms of the uh, structural aspects of the, the whole thing. But uh, I, I, I'd rather not talk about them. Thank you. My kids are building an Omni drone, and they say that's already good enough. It decouples the translational rotational motions, and they're happy. But this I can see for entertainment shows and things like that. This can go into entertainment industry, make a big... So <laughs> Naira, I am so glad that you identified the only industry we could identify to make these things entertaining for sure. It is the entertainment industry. Now, we hope we can make them useful for other things as well. But I would say the entertainment is quite, uh, uh, is quite uh, interesting. Uh, it's quite entertainment, interesting creativity, outreach, I don't know, engaging students, this Fascinating. And they, uh, but they, but they, uh, they are also like need uh, little problems that need solving. By the way, uh, in particular, of course, uh, dealing with and leveraging the redundancy that naturally comes with these machines, and then uh, and then questions such as what is the shortest wiring that should happen if we wire these things together, uh, and uh, things of that kind. But yes, you're right. The entertainment is super, super No, no you can uh, teach lots of math, optimization, aerodynamics, all these things. I can see the academic impact. But like he talks of last mile delivery, this is not something like that practical. I do not see besides entertainment and teaching a lot of math, aerodynamics. So I, would, uh, I, I, I would beg to, to slightly differ though. Uh, we're going to see how much payload we can lift. And uh, normally, the optimal thing we should get is if the payload we can lift grows linearly with the number of modules that we add. Now, it's probably not going to happen, but you know, if we can lift a decent payload with a drone that basically came in spare parts from a truck, that would be better than having to call the uh, helicopter, the local helicopter, each time we have to do that job. There is also an interesting number, and that number is 25 kilo. 25 kilo marks the boundary between you can fly your thing anywhere you want, anytime you want, and you are now super regulated. Okay, above 25 kilo, you're super regulated and you cannot fly anything you want anywhere you want anymore. And so modularity can help you in that regard by flying the module separately until you're on site. And then... Uh, on site, of course, you warn ahead of time that you're going to be doing some heavy lifting. You assemble these drones, and then you move on. Uh, and then you move on with the job. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>